Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. This is Toronto's Pride Parade. It's one of the biggest celebrations of sexual diversity in the world. But few people remember that Pride began as a protest against the cops. The U.S. estimated to cost the taxpayers of Toronto a quarter of a million dollars, and police with crowbars and sledgehammers. In 1981, Police raided gay bathhouses and arrested 300 men in one of the largest mass arrests in Canadian history. Operation SOAP, as the cops called it, galvanized the queer community to come out onto the streets with a political voice. Today, the parade has grown into a citywide event, and the police have worked at reforming their reputation as anti gay. Why did the police send five men into a women's only space? But in 2000, cops raided another gay club, this time a bathhouse for queer women. The police in this city are out of control. I was there that night, and I was amazed that an ugly episode in history was repeating itself. Since then, I've been asking, what does it take for attitudes in policing to change? Well, lots. But for starters, what if all the gay cops came out of the closet? What is it like to be an openly gay cop? I think that there's a culture here that sends a, a really strong message that you, if you do not fit in, you are not welcome. I really thought I could go my whole career without it ever becoming an issue. This brotherhood of policing doesn't work if somebody's gay. There's gay construction workers, the gay firefighters. You know, why is it different than anybody else doing any other profession? I knew at the outset that even though I'd been given permission to film officers by the Toronto Police Service, the hardest part of making this documentary would be finding cops who would talk to me. The first person who agreed was Constable Jackie O'Keefe. She works at the Sex Crimes Unit. Jackie is an unusual cop because she comes from a different world. I knew her before she crossed the line, when she was a radical lesbian feminist protesting the police on the streets. I was that kid at the marches, marching against police violence. I was in a queer nation. And, uh, you know, we were all very in your face, gay, you know, kiss ins on the subway, all this stuff. But I was spinning my wheels, felt like I wasn't going anywhere, really wanted to, to do something different. My entire life, I'd always wanted to be a police officer. I was 36 years old. This was my last opportunity. So I thought, I'm going to get in shape, and I'm going to apply, and I'm going to see what happens. I was myself. I didn't hide anything. I was totally out. Some people bungee jump, and some people join the police service. I went to police college. I was scared to death. I was like a deer caught in the headlights. and for the first time in 20 years, met women who weren't out. It didn't even occur to me that somebody was in or closeted. It didn't even occur to me. Not that long ago, you couldn't be gay on this service. You would either be drummed out of it by and hazed mercilessly until you left, or you would be relegated to a position that you didn't want and you would never be promoted. She 
today we are going to have about as an engaging a session as you'll ever have here at the Police College. First question I have, uh, just way of hands, and please don't be embarrassed because we're all fellow officers here. How many people have actually believe that I'm gay? Seriously, hands? Constable Paul Regan is one of the few openly gay male cops in the service. This is his second career. He used to work as a camera operator for our local news station. So he's really comfortable with media, and he's agreed to let me follow him around. Nice tight, Superman. Yeah, you like that, eh? <laughs> you wouldn't see me marching in the gay pride parade. Like, look at me, I'm gay, I'm here, and you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, just it's not my thing. It's not what I'm about. You know, I'm a, you know, I'm sort of like the very sort of, you know, private person, and um, that's who I am. Good morning. In policing, um, trust is a big factor. You have to have the trust of your co-workers because they're the people that are out there that are going to be watching your back, and you're going to be watching their back. I sort of made the determination when I was at the Ontario Police College that if asked, I wasn't going to lie. Constable Paul Regan told some fellow recruits he was gay when he was at the police college. By the time he arrived at 12 Division, rumors about his sexuality had preceded him. Mr. Regan, have you got makeup on today? Or? No, sir. No staff, sorry. Have you been tanning, going to those tannings a lot? Just a little bit of Mexico, so I left Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Paul was approached by his coach officer and asked if he was gay. His coach officer, Chris Hutchings, then proceeded to out him to the rest of the unit. It was me that took it upon myself to actually ask Paul straight out. And I think that's the best way to get the information, right? Uh, rather than second or third hand. And uh, it turned out to be true. And just to, to, to quell the rumors, um, yeah, you know, I told everybody, you know what? There's a lot of talk going around. Um, about whether or not Paul's gay, he is. So now you know. Next, you know, and then the next day, instead of worrying about the rumors, you know, you can get on with work. Or we'll start the next rumor. <laughs> you know? I'm told 14 Division was not a safe place to be outed back in the 1990s. When Constable Todd Halehouse joined the service in 1991, he chose not to be open about his sexuality at work. But after eight years at the station, things changed. I walked the tightrope, but up until 1999, no one had indicated any suspicion. I came on the job years ago when my wrongly or rightly preconceived notion was not to ever mention that during the hiring process. I got hired, I got on the job, I never told it anybody. I mean, uh, still in society, being gay was, was not a, an acceptable thing and there was a lot of prejudice and misunderstanding out there and ignorance. And so I never told anybody. I never had any intention of letting anyone here know. It should have no bearing on my job. Once I joined the police department, I stopped going to Pride. Just because there was a large police presence, I felt that the odds were, were astronomical that somebody who I know from work might see me there. Two fellow officers began to suspect Constable Hillhouse was gay, and they've conducted an unauthorized investigation into his life. I got the shock of my life. I was quite surprised, thinking, you know, the, the cat may have been in the bag. I, I really thought I could go my whole career without it ever becoming an issue. They ran his license plate through the system, searched his private records in the human resources files, and began calling his house at odd hours to see who would answer. Obviously now I'm, I'm not passing, but I guess you're in damage control mode, thinking, okay, can we limit that I can still pass with Overall, you know what I mean? Some of the other people. Because I have no idea what, how many people now know. You know, is it still confined to two individuals, three individuals, 10, 20, 50, 100? I don't know. 
you're hoping for the best. You start going to work dreading going to work? Oh yeah, you're dreading going to work. How's it going? The most frustrating aspect of being a lesbian officer is being a lesbian officer. Colleagues? It's said that Detective Judy Nosworthy is the highest ranking out gay cop in the country. When she joined in 1984, she wasn't out. First of all, as a woman, we were all discounted. We were just sort of ornamentation. I mean, the, the running joke was that you were either a mattress or a dyke. A lot of the officers I worked with had participated in the bathhouse raids. And so it wasn't, wasn't really a nice place to be if you were gay or lesbian. Detective Judy Nosworthy wasn't allowed to come out on her own terms. She was dragged out. A personal conflict involving her partner at the time led to a police investigation that exposed Judy's private life to her co-workers. During the course of the investigation, it appears that everybody, a lot of people at 52, knew about the investigation, except me. It was awful. I mean, I felt that my privacy had been stripped away. I really hate the word dyke. I really, I hate it. And so they would say, oh, you know, there's that dyke. And and be walking down the hall, and the hall's not that wide. And, or just as you're walking by, like, dyke. And I, I would say, you know, that's brilliant. They've done an investigation to, un you know, to, to reveal this. And that's the best you could do. Um, and it was just, it was just not nice. It was stupid. Um, I mean, it's the reason people don't come out in high school. And I thought, I'm, I'm back in high school. And there was also a real sense, and it was, it was cultural at that time, um, the, the whole sense that because you're gay, we can't trust you. And then I was advised that I was going to be transferred. I was going to go to the traffic unit. And I was told that because that's where people like me went. And I said, well, what do you mean like me? And I, I said, I'm not going. And I didn't go. I stayed. I found footage of Constable Jackie O'Keefe from her rookie years. She looked so young and green. She said being a cop was a dream from childhood. She wanted to be the hero. And even though the world of policing has never been seen as particularly open to lesbians, gays, or trans people, Jackie thought she was tough enough to handle whatever came her way. Who's on top is always like the biggest question, who's on top? Uh, a huge question is, haven't you ever thought about it? How do you know you don't like it? Uh, if you haven't tried it, you know, in terms of being with a guy. And, you know, and I have those pat, you know, lesbian answers, like, well, how do you know you don't like it if you've never been with a guy? With gay men, it's a whole different ball of wax. There's a huge amount of homophobia heaped upon gay males in the service. Well, I, I think I know very few gay men on the job. Um, I've talked to some, many of them end up in administrative positions, so they don't have to deal with the mentality that they deal with on the, on the street level. Is Cal still missing? Okay, well, part of the thing we're gonna have to do is check the whole house, okay? You're joking. Nope. So can this be done in the morning? Because, like, I have two dogs running through the house right now. Hello, sir. Yeah. How are you doing tonight? Well, going to 12 Division, it's one of the rougher divisions in Toronto. And I was thinking, wow, this will be interesting to see um, how, how I'm going to be accepted there. You live 534. Yeah. So you're, telling, you're taking a piss out here, and you live like three feet away. I couldn't. The people I work with, it, I'm, to them, it's just another fellow officer. I think my sexual orientation, at the end of the day, it's something that's uh, not really discussed. Um, not because it's a problem, it's just like we accept him for who he is. Homosexuality is there, it's not, it's not a secret. 
So people are accepting of it, and it's, it's not a big deal. He'd tell me if he had a problem. He's never had a problem, you know. And like I say, he's a pretty normal guy, pretty cool guy. But I don't know how many gay male cops do you know? Uh, open? Yeah. <laughs> he's actually probably the first one. He's as open as he gets, yeah. and he's probably the first one I know that's been really openly gay. There's there's other guys that you know you got a pretty idea, pretty good idea they are, but for whatever reason they don't want to come out with it. I I don't know what that is. It's a personal choice, right? I've come to the chief's reception for Pride Week to see who shows up and to speak to Constable Jackie O'Keefe. I've had some trouble getting a hold of her recently. It's a party, Minsa. This is an important event for us, and we are mindful of the history of, of the Toronto Police Service and its relationship with this community. And we still have a way to go. I am not suggesting for a moment the work is done, but I am very proud of where we have come from and the progress that we have made together. Have a happy Pride, everyone. Thank you. After the speeches, I asked Jackie why she was not returning my calls. I was called into a senior officer's uh, uh, office to discuss this documentary, and, and that officer asked me, um, asked me some questions that I thought were really uh, invasive and, uh, and threatening. That's right. Well, what did he say to you? It was like the most threatening thing he said. I think a couple of things he said. One was, uh, uh, you have to remember who signs your checks, and you have to remember who puts a roof over your head. When I left the office, I was I was shaking. I was a mess, and I was. That was the moment I thought, oh my God, I, I I'm actually shaking. I'm actually afraid. I'm actually I actually feel intimidated. I was disturbed to learn from Constable Jackie O'Keefe that she had been warned by a senior officer about participating in this documentary. Immediately after telling me this, she stopped returning my calls. Three months went by before I finally reconnected with her. She said she had been under a lot of stress, work-related and personal. I started having panic attacks and anxiety attacks. I, uh, I went to see my doctor because I thought I had a serious illness. Uh, every test known to man was done. I ended up in an ambulance in the hospital. On the, the advice of my doctor, I told her what was going on. I didn't disclose to her everything, but I told her a bit of my stress level, and then she said, you must go off sick, and she insisted I did, and I went off sick. I asked Jackie if being warned about participating in this documentary by a senior officer had played a part in her stress leave. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. That's when I spun out, I went into a tailspin, I, uh, and I left work shortly thereafter. And I stayed off uh, for, I think, two and a half months. Back in 1999, Constable Todd Hillhouse was in the middle of a waking nightmare. He found out just how relentless his harassers were from a sympathetic colleague. This person came back to me and just said, you know, they've been over to see me and they're pumping me for information and they, they told me they think you're gay and they're trying to find out if you are gay and they seem to have some issue with it. And just so you know, they've driven up to your house and sat and watched your house to see who comes in and out of your house. That's spooky. It's terribly spooky. It's terribly spooky. I mean, to think that, you know, I haven't done anything. There's no reason to watch my house. I, I haven't committed any crime. There's no reason for me to be under observation by anybody. Ultimately, one of them approaches me and has an issue with my sexual orientation, doesn't like gay people and shouldn't be on the job and that um, if I am out in the road and a situation calls and I call for backup, that I shouldn't be overconfident that the backup is coming. I just hope that people see me as a police officer first, somebody that can do the job, and 
the rest of the stuff is like, uh, oh, oh, yeah, he's gay. You know, that's irrelevant. You know, it doesn't mean anything. I had court. I had to go to Old City Hall for court, you know, living up in Barry. I go, oh man, I got court tomorrow. So he's like, oh man, like, if you want, you can crash at my house. I said, no, I think Hutch has got court. I'll go to his house. No, he goes, man, you can sleep at my house, right? And then I go, okay, Regan, I said, I don't think I'd be comfortable with that, right? And he's like, he gets all quiet, doesn't say nothing. You wouldn't be comfortable with this? No, <laughs> not at all. Why? It's, it's, the, it's like I said, it's the whole thing. It, I like Regan. But I just, I don't know, I wouldn't be comfortable sleeping in his house. Just, I'm not there yet, you know. I'm just not at that point where I'd be like, yeah, crashing over at the guy's house and stuff. And plus, could you just imagine that? The story's the next day, everybody, oh, John is crashing at Regan's, you know what I mean? You know what's coming. You know how the guys are, it's coming. They're going to be all over you. So, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> The harassment at work began to take its toll on Todd's mental and physical health. He told me about one recurring nightmare. It was pretty well the standard dream every night was um, I stop a car, the person in the car has a gun, they, they shoot me, I'm not dead, I make it to the back of my car, I'm trying to get covered but I am seriously injured. And, and the person is now advancing on me, I know they're gonna come around the corner and shoot me and I'm waiting, waiting, and the help never comes. And, and they step around the corner with the gun and they point it at me and the dream ends and you, you wake up and you're in a cold sweat and you're terrified. You can imagine what it does to the inside of you, the stress level like inside your body, even if, even if you don't understand that it's stressing your body out, but I'm saying it's having an effect, whether you like it or not. With gay and lesbian officers, when we hire them, do they stay? And if not, why not? And if it's just a case of this isn't the job for them, that's fine. But if it's a case of this environment is not hospitable, then we need to look at why. Do they stay, in your opinion? Generally, no. It cannot be a safe place for male gay officers to come out because they don't come out. It may be fine for me to say, yes, it's safe, but that's not my experience. Have you talked to other lesbian officers who share these views? Nobody wants to talk about it. Because I, I think it's a part of, it might be a much deeper, deeper thing of the inherent homophobia that we all carry within ourselves. It's like, of course, like, who, who did you think you would be, that you could be, you know, a lesbian and you could do this? You know what? One of the lesbians said one time that just saying penis grossed her out, right? Because she's not into it, right? And I said, well, that's me. <laughs> I said, the thought of that is like, ugh, gives me the heebie-jeebies, right? But you think about it, if a straight guy is going, oh, yeah, that's cool, well, he's probably not straight. <laughs> There's like, there's the line, and you know, the famous thing is, okay, now you cross that line a little bit, so go back, right? Because they'll be telling you all about, all about their uh, great weekend they had with somebody they met, and it's like, okay, well, let me tell you about mine. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, so it's almost like it's a double standard, you know? They do want to hear, but they really don't, but then at the same time, they want to throw in a little, like, you know, oh, there's the line, you're crossing it, but are they offended? No, it's just so like, oh, we're not quite ready to hear that yet, you know, type of thing, but I think deep down, they're just, Throwing that out there because they have no problems with it. No, I, no, Regan, right? He's just like a regular guy. The way he is and his personality and as a guy, I got no problems with that. It's when he talks about the sexual stuff, oh, well, I'm not into that because I'm straight, so I'm like, ugh. You know? The police service likes to promote the fact that there is a lesbian and gay liaison officer who works out of headquarters. It was Detective Judy Nosworthy who pushed for the official position to be created. 
In 2001, six months after the police raided the woman's bathhouse, her proposal was finally accepted by the then newly appointed police chief, Julian Fantino. Fantino's installment had been widely criticized by gay activists. He was tainted by investigations he'd led in other cities that equated homosexuality with pedophilia. One of his first tasks as the new chief was mending bridges with the face of Toronto's diversity. They basically said, there's your desk, and like whatever you need, just let us know. I said, okay. And they said, oh, by the way, the chief is doing a, a walkabout in the Church Wellesley community tomorrow. Okay. And so fortunately, I, my, um, I had my uniform, I was good to go. I had no idea that it was going to be this big media extravaganza thing, and, and I'd never met the chief before, and so it was, that was the beginning of the job. And uh, I did that job for a year and got promoted. Constable Jackie O'Keefe then took over the vacant position as the city's lesbian and gay liaison officer. Jackie did the job for three years, but left the position deeply dissatisfied. I wanted to be the lesbian and gay liaison officer for the Toronto Police. I wanted to represent the police to my community, to the gay community. I thought, what an incredible opportunity to make some real change and to demystify my favorite word, because that's basically what I do with everything that frightens me, to demystify cops, queers. For me, it got very hard to listen to the litany of people who felt they were treated poorly. I would encourage them to lodge complaints. Almost, I would say none of them ever did. Thank you for calling your election. The bottom line is they're afraid. It doesn't sound like they put a lot of importance on the position. Yeah, that's how I felt. I feel, well, I don't know. I mean, when you're in a corporation, it starts to feel like, you know, flavor of the month. Like, you know, gay issues are really important this year because the Pussy Palace was raided and it's gay, 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 gay. Let's fix all this. Let's make it okay. And all the dust settles and things are fixed and things are addressed. And then you feel like there's a there's an attitude of this is over. So let's uh, let's get rid of it. You know, let's do this. Does we don't need this anymore. I was very disheartened by the end of it because of what they were doing with the position. It is all bull. They really don't give a crap. Of all the gay cops that would talk to me on camera, Constable Todd Hillhouse has the most disturbing story. He endured 18 months of anti-gay harassment at his station. His stuff was vandalized. He began to get threatening calls at home. I'm dreading going to work. I mean, Yes, I want to be a police officer and I want to be here, but I don't know what's next, it's that unknown. And, and you have no control. During this whole time period, I've started to develop some health issues. Right after I eat, there's this intolerable pain, and eventually what happens is I go off work sick. And a doctor, my family doctor, sends me to a specialist. Um, they inform me that I've all of a sudden developed some bowel disorders. I have some holes in my esophagus from acid burning through. And um, they put me on some pretty strong uh, medication, Demerol, to withstand the pain. I dropped 30 pounds during this time. I end up off work. Constable Hillhouse had no choice but to use all of his sick pay, which eventually ran out. He had to fight to receive a settlement. And when he got back, he was transferred to a desk job at headquarters. I've been speaking with other gay cops who have stories that are just as disturbing, but they won't appear on camera, even anonymously, and they refuse to name their harassers. They're afraid of losing their jobs, their pensions, and their reputations. Yet Paul Regan is probably the happiest gay cop I've ever met. What is it about Regan that lets him be accepted? Because like, there's 7,000 people in the Toronto Police Force. There's very few guys are out. 
Oh yeah. No, you're, well, I told you, twelve years. One that I know. Of, that I know of, that I've worked with. I know there's others that I've been. That I can actually say I worked with. Yeah, one. Why? Because they're afraid they're going to be probably ridiculed or made fun of or whatever. Okay, so you see Regan as being used as a poster child? Well, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I could see wanting to use him as a poster child for the police service and the whole gay thing. But I don't know if that's necessarily the direction he wants to go, right? Because he makes it look good. Makes oh, the yeah, service yeah, look yeah. good. Yeah, for sure, right? It's been almost six months since Constable Jackie O'Keefe returned to work from her stress leave. Now, when we talk, she's more frank about her experiences. The more stuff said about gay women is, uh, she's a dyke, or, you know, she needs a good screw, or, you know, things like that. Phrases that they use to describe females, cum buckets. Um, you know, uh, clamps, uh, disgusting, foul, uh, offensive, you know, words that I've never heard, I've never heard of before. There's something said, or almost every day there's something done that will just make you go, why am I here? Even though Detective Judy Nosworthy is reputedly the highest ranking out gay cop in the country, she points out to me that it's not that impressive. After 25 years, she's only risen one rank above constable. And although she's no longer the target of any direct harassment, there are other ways she gets the message she doesn't belong. Do you feel you've been investigated a lot because you're gay and out? I feel that I've been investigated because I'm gay and out. There were times where I, I don't really see any merit to the investigation. And there are times where I've been investigated where, yeah, you know, there's some allegation of wrongdoing or misconduct, and that's fine. I have no problem with that at all. Guy comes in right away with a sharp object, leaf, these scissors are nice. But other times it's just because I'm interesting. I would think that, that would make the average person pretty paranoid. I just think, you know, if you want to investigate, go ahead. There's nothing here. When Constable Todd Hillhouse told me how he'd been targeted and harassed, I assumed he would want some kind of justice. But he never lodged a formal complaint and he refused to name his harassers. He still sees one of them regularly in the hallways. Up till now, I haven't complained, and certainly that option did exist. I chose not to complain. But, um, I mean, it's very hard subject to talk about. I mean, even today, all these years later, it's still difficult to some degree to talk about it and that. I mean, basically, I've gone from being in the closet to I've just been outed against my will. Do you still see your harasser? I have seen him occasionally, just in passing. I don't hold a grudge. I'm, I'm not looking for revenge or, or anything. I, you know, it's, it's water under the bridge. I can't change it, it's done. I can't forget about it, but I, I just want to move on. Well, you say he's moved on. Do you mean he's moved up? He's moved up. Any organization has their has their corporate look, and it's you know the people who you know on their days off all play golf together. They all live in the same community. They all vacation in Florida. They all you know there's a real homogeny to it. I'm not that person. I'm I'm not particularly interested in being that person. And if I paid a price for that, then well I did. But I'm not that person. By virtue of the power invested in me under the Marriage Act... Detective Judy Nutty is the kind of person who still believes in institutions, like the institution of marriage. 
A few of her fellow officers came to her wedding, but they asked not to be on camera. It's not the blatant, sexist, revolting misogyny. It's not that. It's that daily corrosion. I have no more armor. I ha I'm exhausted. I, I can't do it anymore. So every comment that may have rolled off my back five years ago is now I'm finding the recovery time is just, there's not enough recovery time between the between the insults, between the lack of consciousness, between the, you know, there's never enough recovery. So um, now it's just, I can't, I can't even bounce back anymore. So, so I'm, uh, I'm leaving as soon as I can, so. You're sick of it. I can't tell you how sick of it I am. I'm just, I already feel like I betrayed myself a, a thousand times and I can't live with myself anymore. I'm at the annual Pride Parade again. It's been a full year since I started seeking the stories of gays inside the police service. I'm surprised to meet Constable Todd Hillhouse. Well, let me correct that. Sergeant Todd Hillhouse. After 18 years on the service, he's just been promoted. I've been promoted to sergeant, and I actually start tomorrow at 13 Division. How do you feel about that? I feel wonderful. I feel a little apprehensive. It's a new, new role um, for me in the service, but uh, I'm very excited. Uh, a little bit scared, but very excited. Looking forward to it. When we first met, Todd told me he used to come to the march in disguise. I asked him how it feels to be out and in uniform. I did it, and, and I think it sends several messages to other officers if they're thinking about it. Somebody's got to do it, so, you know, if, if enough people start to do it, I'm just one of many, perhaps next year more will do it. If there's somebody out there and they have what it takes, and the only reason they're not applying is because of their sexual orientation, I encourage you, come down, fill out an application, I just think it's an incredible career. Constable Paul Regan didn't march at Pride. He had to work. But for him, gay pride is a battle that's already been won. I think it's only a matter of time that uh, there'll be a gay person living on every block. And somebody will be saying to somebody, oh, my gay neighbors, or my, you know, whatever. And now, you know, we've gone through the whole racial, uh, visible minority stuff. Now we're going on to the path of, you know, sexual orientation, you know. I'm quite not sure what's next after that, but you know, it'll be interesting. Well, aren't you a little bit surprised at the amount of acceptance you've had on the service? Um, acceptance? Yeah. As in good or bad, like I, I, I'm not surprised. You know, and I, you know, I thought of coming into like, you know, a zoo or whatever, like, you know, craziness and all kinds of, you know, stuff going on, but no, everybody's been great here. Right from the like unit command all the way down. I can honestly say I've not had one negative experience. I hope that the subtleties of homophobia don't begin to eat away at him, you know? The jokes, the, uh, the physical moving away from him, the not sitting too close, the fear if he touches them, the, the um, you know, I hope, that, uh, I hope that he has a different experience. I really do. But do you think he will? No. I hope that Constable Regan's career as a cop isn't jeopardized because he's gay or defined by his sexuality. I'd like to believe change is happening inside the service, 
But the story of gay cops so far is they don't exist, or if they do, they just don't stay. If we truly want to see change in policing, then it needs to start with the makeup of the force itself. After all, diversity is the jewel in Toronto's crown. But if our police force can't tolerate it from within, then how can we trust them to protect what we love best about this city? If you leave, they win. Because if what you're saying is that that there is sexism, that there is homophobia, and you go, then there will be sexism and homophobia. But if you make people confront it every day, then something has to change. Is that why you've stayed so long? I think so. But I think for me, the path has been different. See you guys later. It hasn't been a about promotion the way it has been for other people. It hasn't been about the same opportunities as other people. It's been about opening doors for other people. And when you're sort of one of the first or the fir part of the first wave, you're not gonna go as far as the next wave and the wave after that. I wanna be here so that people can see that I was here, not so much that Judy Nosworthy was here, but that an out lesbian is here. And that's not going to change. Are you certain you're leaving? Yeah, I'm pretty certain. I mean, you know, I, I reserve the right to change my mind, but I feel pretty strongly about the fact that I'm, I'm wanting to uh, find a place that's a little less conflicted and a little, uh, a little less misogynist and sexist. I think I'd like an environment that, uh, you know, I could, I could call the shots myself and I don't have to be exposed to individuals who have issues with uh, women or homosexuals, you know? You leaving, is that part of a dream diet? Do I look at it as a dream dying? No, I, I, I don't. I look at it as a, a dream fulfilled, whether I stay or not. I, and, and at this point, uh, nothing is going to make me stay. So. I thought it was changing. And, and you know what? It has changed. 20 years ago, like if you came out, you were basically dead. Now it's way better. But for me, better doesn't make it good. <laughs>